The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I just want to say how touched I am that you are all still here. I, I really... <laughs> You know, there's a lot of shopping opportunities in the MIT uh, uh, courses, um, and that you have come back and not shaken loose after reading Satoshi Nakamoto's peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer Bitcoin paper, um, or maybe you just came back to see whether I was going to crash and burn describing it. Um, but what we're going to try to do in the next three classes, just to frame it, is really give you some of the technical underpinnings of blockchain technology through the lens of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is just the first use case of blockchain technology. Um, so if I often say Bitcoin this or Bitcoin that, it's really largely, not entirely, largely applicable to blockchain technology. My feeling is I'm only about eight or nine months ahead of all of you. I may have spent my whole professional life around finance and public service, and I can talk a lot about markets and about public policy, but MIT has given me the gift of thinking about blockchain technology, and I'm trying to return that gift a little bit for you all. <laughs> and I have a few computer scientists in the room that are gonna bail me out if I don't get this right. Uh, Sabrina, and then, oh, I see, Aline is putting up his uh, do you all know Aline? He's actually a PhD student at MIT Computer Science. So, <laughs> somebody gets to that part of their life. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what was that? Terrible life choice. Terrible life choice. Yeah. <laughs> but he's going to bail us all out. But the reason that I think it's relevant not to just uh, belabor it is I really believe the only way that any of us can get to ground truths is to know a little bit about how the inner workings of this technology are. Uh, you're not gonna have to do an algorithm or actually do a hash function, <laughs> but to know underneath it, and then you can step away and say, I no longer need to know how the carburetor on the car works, but I know what a carburetor is, or, or you know, whatever analogy you want. So with that little bit, um, as opposed to sort of all that Socratic cold calling that I did last uh, class, because money, fiat currency, is something at the core, and ledgers is at the core of a Sloan student's uh, either education or background, this is a little less of the core. If today's and the next couple of lectures, if you can work with me, that I want you to interrupt me anytime you've got a question. I'm, I'm not going to do much cold calling. Oh, I don't want you to relax too much. I still want you to do the readings the next three classes. But just raise your hand, stop me, say, well, but what, what is that all about? And that um, is just so that we can work a little bit different on these uh, next uh, classes. So as I'm always going to be doing, consistency, um, what are the study questions? Um, so really, what are the design features? What are the key design features of this new technology, blockchain? And I, I put a few uh, on the syllabus, and we're going to go through all this t today and, and next week. Cryptography, append-only, timestamps, uh, blocks, distributed consensus algorithms, and networking. I list four. Later in this lecture, you'll see uh, eight or 10, that, uh, I guess it's 10 that we're gonna really dig, dig into. Um, can I just get a sense of the class, and this is not for Talita or Sabrina to write down notes about participation. Is it a decent assumption? Did, did most of, or all of you at least read Nakamoto's paper? All right, good. All right, great. Uh, just a sense, how many of you felt you got at least half of it Maybe less than two thirds, but at least half of it. All right, pretty good. When I first read it, I was about with you, so it's all right. 
Elaine, you got more than half of it, right? I read it five years ago, so. Yeah. You read it five years ago, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, life choices, talk, talk about it. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, and you're taking this class. Good, good. Um, uh, so we'll go through each of those. And then more specifically, we're gonna peel back the cryptography. The two main cryptographic algorithms, or these words that you'll hear sometimes, cryptographic primitives. I mean, what is a cryptographic primitive? Oh, it's, it's a wild piece. There's so many of them. No, but what's the two words together mean? Well, that's what I'm saying. It could be anything. It could be a hash function. It could be an encryption function. It could be a verifiable computation scheme. It could be a data outsourcing scheme. It could be a data access privacy access scheme. But it's anything that basically protects the communication and the presence of adversaries. Well, right? it's also something that you can use to prove that computation was done correctly on an untrusted server. So it's not just communication. It's also computation. So communications and computation that needs to be protected or verified have some form of cryptographic algorithm, which happens to be called a cryptographic primitive. The two main ones, and there's a third one we'll talk about later in this semester, but the two main ones, hash functions, just as a working knowledge of blockchain is worthy to know, and we're gonna, we're gonna get, everybody's gonna get there. We're gonna all get there to where you have some sense of what a hash function is. And then this whole concept of digital signatures, which relates to asymmetric cryptography. Those two are very fundamental to blockchain technology. Later in the semester, we'll talk a little bit about zero knowledge proofs, but they're not as fundamental to the first application. And so that's why they're, you know, kind of, and they help make things verifiable and immutable. And that's the business side, the market side. Why does it matter? Otherwise, like who cares what's in the carburetor if it doesn't matter? Um, and then how does this all relate to the double spend problem? I can cold call on, on this. Isabella, do you remember what the double spend problem was from? Yes, it was when they would use the same coin, I guess, and they would use it in multiple places and other, like multiple digital wallets would receive it. All right, so in essence, a double spend is when you have a piece of information and you use it twice. And we haven't called this piece of information money, but you use it twice. You can send an email to two people, and that's OK. I mean, it's a little embarrassing if you're sending it to one friend telling them you're available for dinner, and the other friend thought you told them you weren't available. But you can still send it to two places. But in the system of money, it's a critical thing that you don't use it twice. Um, the readings, uh, did, did, was the demo helpful? I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna do a lot more on the demo. I watched that demo last November or December. It was one of the first things I watched. I'm an MIT student. I don't know if you knew this Bosworth. Um, and uh, I found it very helpful, so I'm glad. It, it, and I see it's actually that demo is on a Stanford blockchain course as well. So on the West Coast, one of our competitors is using an MIT product. Um, and uh, so we're gonna, we're going to just do a slight review of what we did in class two, and then we're going to talk about the key design features, hash functions, as I mentioned, what is an append-only log, block headers and Merkle trees, and asymmetric cryptography and digital signatures. Crazy. We're going to cover all five of those today. <laughs> and then you're going to uh, tell me how we did. Oh, Bitcoin addresses, which is just a small thing. Six, actually. Um, so last time, for those of you that weren't with us, we talked about money. And again, money is just a social construct or an economic consensus mechanism. We're going to talk a lot about consensus next Tuesday when we talk about the consensus protocol on Bitcoin. But remember, money itself is just a consensus. Uh, there was a question on Tuesday. Uh, I think Aline actually had asked this question about, but what does it mean to be a liability of the central bank? Why is money, what does that actually mean? And I said it just means that somebody else will accept it. It's a social consensus because it's not that they're going to give you anything else. It's just that you can get a bank deposit, you can pay your taxes, you can use it at Starbucks if, in fact, you've already gotten a cup of coffee, if you remember. It's only legal tender for a debt. Um, and so forth. 
fiat money is just in that long line, uh, but it's had its challenges and stabilities. It doesn't mean it's going to go away. Uh, I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist and thinks that fiat currencies are going to go away, but fiat currencies have their instabilities, particularly around uh, weak monetary policy. In essence, when you debase a currency and allow a lot of it to be issued, or usually around unstable fiscal policy. So either the government is spending a lot, the king is off to foreign wars, and the Bank of England was actually set up in the late 17th century, in essence, to control the currency when the king was of England, I think it was in wars with France, if I can recall. It, it, a lot of banks, uh, central banks were set up right about when a sovereign was, was off debasing a currency and spending too much at war. Uh, ledgers, we talked about ledgers, how critical ledgers are. In essence, ledgers are a way to keep uh, records. And those records could either be transaction records or balance records. We'll see that Bitcoin is set up as a transaction ledger system. Later, we're going to be talking about other blockchain technologies that are set up as balance ledgers. So one should not just think immutably that there's only one way to do this. But transactions and ledgers are at the core of Bitcoin. And central banking is, of course, built on ledgers. The master ledger of the central bank and then the commercial banks have sort of the sub-ledgers. And then you can think sometimes your digital wallet, maybe Starbucks, has yet a third tier ledger. Um, we obviously live in an electronic age already. We know this. There's been many efforts, they've all died until Bitcoin, to crack that riddle that we talked about, peer-to-peer -peer money without a central authority. And later in the semester when we talk about what are the use cases, that's going to be the core thing. That's why I'm not a maximalist. I'm not sure in every circumstance a central uh, intermediary is necessarily so bad. And this is not a value judgment. This is just pure money and markets and so forth. But in some circumstances, decentralization really will compete and beat the centralized intermediary. So let's talk about uh, his uh, little paper, which, of course, he, he was modest or she was modest. Uh, please remind me. We don't know who Nakamoto is or was uh, or a group of people. I've been working on a new electronic cash uh, system that's fully peer-to-peer -peer with no trusted third party. Um, so you've seen this slide before, but a time-stamped append-only law. Just think blocks of data. You know, it's, it's to kind of oversimplify, but it's got a name blockchain. And I don't think, did Satoshi's paper, you all read it in the last few days, I, of course, read it again yesterday just to make sure I remembered it. I don't remember that he ever used the word blockchain. Am I right about that? Right. So the words blockchain are really uh, have been sort of layered over his uh, innovation. So information, blocks going on, and that leads to basically a database. But it's the blocks of data. Bitcoin right now is about 550,000 blocks. And the blocks are added on average every 10 minutes. And we'll talk about why it's every 10 minutes and not only why uh, Satoshi Nakamoto made it every 10 minutes, but how they maintain that. Other blockchains, like Ethereum, it's about every seven seconds. So don't get too caught up that it's all the same. <laughs> and, and, and there's some technologists here, Silvio McCalley is working on Algorand, and, and that's even tighter, less than seven seconds. So there's not one way. There's multiple designs on how often blocks are added. But let's start with Bitcoin. Secured by, yes, guess what? Those two cryptographic primitives, hash functions and digital signatures. You lose anybody yet? Yeah, <laughs> maybe. And then there's a consensus for agreement. The whole debate usually about databases is who gets to change the data. And this is true in all databases in its essence. It's usually centralized. But in blockchain, it's all of a sudden, well, maybe it's not centralized. Who gets to add that next bit of information, that next block? 
And the consensus agreement is, which we'll discuss next Tuesday, is about that very issue. And I think there was a little pretty picture that I'd done in slides before. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna delay that discussion until next Tuesday. And hopefully you all come back. So <clears throat> what are the key features? Um, and I might do a little cold calling. Do you remember any key feature, Tom, from, from the papers? Um, oh boy. Um, oh, it's all right. Yeah. Me have the hash function. All right, hash function. Any other key features? Let's see how many. I'm going to have 10 on this page. Uh, private and public key. What's that? Private and public keys. Private, private. Oh, private and public key, yes. So asymmetric cryptography or private and public key. Yes, hash functions. Yes, private and public key. Any other uh, kind of key design features or, or words you didn't understand? Maybe that's another way to put it. Uh, Leandro. Addresses. What's that? Addresses. Bitcoin addresses. Three. Uh, ten step server. Time stamp server. That's four of the things. This is going well. Uh, we have double payment. Double payment is is something that's trying to address. It's not really a design feature, but it's a they have a solution for double payment. So I'll give you credit for it. But it's um, all right. So Hugo says miners, which is really the consensus. So I'll 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 say that the design feature is the consensus or proof of work. Kelly. The full node versus the lightweight node. All right, so very interesting, this concept of nodes. And Satoshi actually talks about full nodes or lightweight nodes, in essence, how much information has to be stored. I'm going to reserve that. Kelly, please remind me when we talk about block headers to come back to that. But nodes and the network is a very important design feature over here. Uh, Merkle tree structure. The Merkle tree structure. The Mer Merkle tree structure. So Merkle tree structure is a way to compress a lot of data and also to sort through that data. Uh-oh, there's no, no, Sabrina's not going to clean me out here. Merkle tree structure is there. We're going to talk about that. Two more. Like nonce. What's that? The nonce. No, the notes. All right. What's that? Nonce. Nonce. The nonce. Okay. So a nonce. Anybody know what the word nonce is? A year ago, I didn't. So we're all getting there. Do I have a look? Do you know what a nonce is? No. In, in the actual protocol, it's essentially a guess for the, the miners to add. So the word nonce means a random number that is used once. N for number. N once. It's a number that's random, and it's used once. That's how I've learned it. Oh, and so one more, because it's a, this is great, actually. Peer to peer. Remind me your first name. Priya. Priya, peer to peer. All right. So how this is what I have. Cryptographic hash functions. We're going to go through these uh, in more detail. Time stamped append-only logs. Uh, block headers and Merkle trees. So Merkle trees were discussed, but we need to actually say what, what information is kept at the head of the block as opposed to all the, bo the body. And some of that's just to make it more manageable. Asymmetric cryptography, which is this public key, private key, and signatures. The Bitcoin addresses themselves, which interestingly are a little bit different than public keys. And then I, I, I breach, break, because I'm, the next we're going to talk about next Tuesday. The proof of work, the miners, the, the, the nodes, uh, the nonces are all in that. A little topic. There's actually in Bitcoin a really important protocol is how information gets propagated on the internet. Just the network communication. It's not written about a lot. You won't read a lot about it in Nathaniel Popper's Digital Gold or all the other popular books, but it is an important thing to remind ourselves that information has to propagate around the internet and, and all these transactions have to communicate with each other. There's currently about 10,000 nodes on the Bitcoin network. We don't know where all, the, all of them are, but they're probably in 180 different countries. And so it's just uh, also the networking and communication matters. And it matters to the economics a lot. Uh, there's a native currency, and this is interesting. That was the one thing that no one said. That's an actual technological design feature 
it's not only that he created a currency, but the native currency is part of the economic incentive system. And we'll have some fun with that. In essence, he said that when you mined and did the proof of work, you created and you got some native currency called Bitcoin. So he created an economic incentive system. Whomever Satoshi Nakamoto was or is, knew a lot about economics as well as technology. Yes? I just wanted to quickly add to what you said. So it's not only that you create this native currency, but once the finite supply is reached, the currency can be distributed as a transaction fee, which I think is a very important and intentional. Right. And remind me your first name? Daniel. So what Daniel just said is, is really interesting, not only to take light of this individual or individuals that did this, but this world of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies creates a unit of, of account that could be valued, and once it's valued, you have sort of a native currency. But as Daniel said, Nakamoto also said there would be a finite limit. Uh, it happens to be 21 million Bitcoin is the most it can be, and we'll get there around the year 2040. Does anyone know how many Bitcoin there are right now? About half of you are invested in it, so I was kind of curious. Hugo? About 17 million Bitcoin right now. And all 17 million have come from this process of proof of work and mining. Initially, it was 50 Bitcoin every 10 minutes, roughly every 10 minutes. Then uh, it went down to 25, and we're now at 12 and a half Bitcoin. And does anyone know what today's value uh, purported, I always should say purported value of Bitcoin, because I don't know if you can trust some of those websites that say what the values are. What, what is it? So $6,500 of Bitcoin at 12 and a half Bitcoin to mine a block. Um, uh, so you, you, you see that it's about 80,000 US dollars is the reward to mine a block, right. So, so there, he created an incentive system that initially, if you got 50 Bitcoin and they weren't worth a penny, you would not commit that much. It had, you had to be a hobbyist, basically, in 2009, or a cyberpunk, or just kind of curious, because you weren't getting much incentive. If, in fact, it's worth 6,500 today, you're getting $80,000 if you actually successfully mine a block. And then there's the transaction inputs and outputs. Think about a, a check, you know, who signs it, where you move money. There's something called the unspent transaction ledger. So this is the ledger part. So when you think, I think of the technology, I think of cryptography, which is kind of all that stuff at the top, which we're gonna discuss today. Secondly, the consensus mechanism. In essence, that's that key question of any database, who gets to amend the database? Who gets to decide to change the state of what we all agree to? And then thirdly is the ledger or the transaction ledger, which uh, we're not gonna deep dive into the scripting language, but we are next Thursday gonna talk a little bit about the underlying scripting. So does that give you a path? It's, the, all this cryptography, the consensus, and then the transactions. Yes. Uh, I have a and question. Saying, yeah. If everybody just says first name. Oh, uh, I'm just curious. Uh, so you mentioned that the. I'm curious about your first name. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so just curious. Did you mention that the uh, per block value is roughly eighty thousand U.S. dollars as of as of now? So just curious. Um, in terms of the CPU power, the electricity that will be consumed to to mine per block, how much does that? translate into equivalent in US dollar terms? So the question that's asked is how much uh, electricity is being consumed uh, for that miner to get that reward, that $80,000. And uh, I'm gonna try to answer in one minute, but we'll come back to this later in the semester about economics and blockchain economics and mining economics. But what has happened over these 10 years is more and more computers that are being used are, are trying to mine for the Bitcoin. And so today, and the most recent research I've seen, <clears throat> is that 
the probability of winning a block, there's so much, um, is it measured in terahashes? I can't remember the, the, the numbers, but it's how many terahashes, which is, is it 15 zeros is a terahash? Whose tracker is it 12? No. Well, in any event, there's so many hashes being done a second, uh, X number of terahashes, that your probability of winning is quite low. And so what's happened is most nodes and miners have entered into agreements called mining pools, where they smooth out the risk and everybody shares in the rewards. But those economics we'll talk about later, it's thought to be that uh, you need electricity cost around three cents a kilowatt hour to be successful. And in most parts of the world, you can't get electricity for three cents a kilowatt hour. So you would put your mining rigs where you can get low cost electricity or uh, where you possibly can, you could get it legally low cost or illegally low cost. So there are, there are a lot of mining rigs and in jurisdictions where there may be local officials that are allowing those mining rigs and instead of three cents a kilowatt hour to the electric company, it's one to two cents a kilowatt hour to the local government officials. So, and the two largest mining pools are in China and the third is in Russia. Um, but we'll get into the sort of the economics and at least some theories about why some are where they are. So cryptography. So Aline's probably going to clean me up. It's not just communication in the presence of adversaries. It's also computation in the presence of adversaries. Is that, that would be good. And we, we talked about, we're not going to deep, deep dive. If you remember, even in ancient times, if you were going to war, there was this wonderful little way that you could do cryptography. And then anybody who's seen imi uh, imi imitation games? Yeah. Uh, 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 about the, the British ha you know, breaking into the German codes, even though they should have probably given more credit to the Polish uh, uh, government that had probably broken into it in the 1930s. But Turing did great work. And then we're going to talk about asymmetric cryptography today. Okay, what is a hash function? <laughs> a hash function, and I, these are just words that I think of it. I think of it as a fingerprint for data. Um, but it has certain properties. The, the one that you'll see throughout is that it takes inputs of uh, input X, it maps that input of any size to a fixed size. So one that we use here in the US, one hash function we all use is zip codes in a way. It's five digits, it's a fixed size. I know I'm, I'm doing this as a loose hand, you know, how can I think of it? But zip codes, you, you might have 50,000 people or 5,000 people all living in one, in one postal district, and you can map them to zip codes, and it's a, it's a fixed length. Now, I don't know whether my friends in the computer science departments, but, but it's an early sense of a hash function. I just wanted to say there are, there are tangible things in our life that act like hash functions. Problem with zip codes is it will not in any way be a secure hash function, and you'll see that in a minute. But it does take, uh, you can be a 300 pound person or a 30 pound kid, and you still map into the same zip code. Um, it's deterministic, it's always the same. So if you take a certain set of data, it will always give you the same hash, and that's relevant to the, the, the background. And you can efficiently compute it. You don't want to take a year to do this. You've got to do it in, in short periods of time. And in Bitcoin's case, it's done in nanoseconds or less because there, one computer, one CPU can do, I um, can't remember, probably how many millions a second? A couple of terahashes a second. A couple of terahashes a second. So it's a remarkably efficient algorithm. And it's a bunch of mathematicians. And, and uh, hashing started in the 1950s and 60s, but the ones that we're talking about here are much more recent. But it's, it's really terrifically talented scientists, mathematicians, computer scientists, and sometimes the National Institute Standards of Technology here in the US working on hash functions. So 
It takes an array of any size, puts it into a fixed number. I think zip codes for a minute. Um, it's deterministic. It's always, you only live in one zip code in a sense, and it's very efficient. But now what are its cryptographic properties? Because a zip code wouldn't make it. It just wouldn't. Well, the computer scientist uses the term pre-image resistant. I would just say it's one way. You can only go one way, meaning it's infeasible to determine the input from the output. It's infeasible to determine the, the x from the hash of x. Does anybody know why I use the word infeasible rather than impossible? First name is uh, because we can do it with brute force. So you might be able to use it brute force. What do you mean by brute force, just so everybody? Try all the options. And try. try all options. But as I understand it, a sort of tenet of cryptography for centuries is not to have it mathematically impossible. It's, it's the point is getting it so in, infeasible that your adversary can't either get the communication or so forth. So hash functions, I just say this because you can't assume that Bitcoin can't be broken. We all call it immutable. It is immutable until the hash functions that are inside of Bitcoin might be broken. And even Satoshi wrote about this in 2010. He got emails. There's this wonderful book, if any of you want, that I mentioned in the bookshelf at the end of the syllabus. He said, well, what if uh, SHA-256, which is the hash function, gets broken, and, and his answer, by the way, was, well, there'll be a better hash function at that time, whatever that is, will hash the entire system, whatever that is, because remember, you can take something of any size, hash it with the new system, and move forward. And so he, he, he or she felt in this wonderful email is that Bitcoin actually could transition to a new hash function as long as you, you know, had a little bit of time before it was all corrupted. Kelly. So this one, his article called the gambler's ruin problem. Is that what you're describing? The gambler's ruin problem. Yeah, the probability that an attacker could catch up to like cre recreating it. Okay. No, no, that's something else. That's. Uh, that's something you want to speak a little louder? Yeah. yeah. So that's. Uh, the, the, if I recall correctly, you know, you want to sort of assess how hard is it to fork Bitcoin. If I have a lot of computational power, how hard is it for me to create a fork? And Satoshi does an analysis at the end of the paper. Oh, 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 I apologize. You're talking about in his paper. Yes, in his paper, he's talking about how hard it is computationally to do what some people call a 51% attack, to basically take over all the nodes. And that part of his paper we're going to talk about next Tuesday, but it's basically, can you take over the nodes? I was talking about a separate thing. Can you break the cryptography? And he doesn't write about that in his paper. He writes about it in an email about 10 months later or so. Second key cryptographic thing. So we said one is it's one way. The other thing is this concept of collision um, resistant. I presume if everybody in this room told me your birthdays, there's multiple people in this room who have the same birthday. And in fact, if we got it past 26 people in a room, it's over 50% chance that two of you have the same birthday. We don't need to get to 183 people in the room, uh, which is half of the days of the year. We, we can get to about 26 or 7. And, and um, uh, similarly, the key thing is, is that two sets of data are, it's again infeasible that X and Y would hash to the same thing. It's not impossible, it's infeasible. And if you look at the history of hash functions, this is usually the thing. They, at some point in time, these hash functions will not be collision resistant. Some quantum computing will come along or something will come along. But for now, you can put something of any size in and they're independent. They also look terribly random. It's called an avalanche effect, meaning you change one little difference 
and the whole thing looks different. So when you noticed on that little video, if you changed one thing, it all looks so different. And why that's important is it makes it more secure. And then there's something called puzzle friendliness. Even if you know a little bit of the input, it doesn't mean that you're gonna get the output. I put these up here not for you to know them. You're not gonna get tested. If you go into business, uh, as uh, Elon, you've started when you probably haven't thought, well, you know, collision resistant, this or that. But I just wanted you to know there is a bunch of cryptography underneath this. And um, the, the key is it is not 100% immutable. It's like probably one in, you know, I don't know, a quadrillion immutable, but there's still, these things could be broken. And quantum computing and something else might. But Aline, so the actual probability should be actually one over two to the power of 128. So it's much more than one in quadrillion. So, so it's one over 10 to about the 40th. How'd I do? My math all right? All right. Um, and anybody who's interested can come to office hours and we'll <laughs> find. Um, so it's, it's highly unlikely to be broken but I think it's always worthwhile to say, well, no, there, there's some outward, it's, it's not as bounded as you think. Um, so what, what is it used for? In, in many places, it's used for names and references and, and pointers and, and something called commitments. Uh, in Bitcoin, it's, it's used for pointers because one block points to another block, um, but it's also used uh, in commitments. Um, You'll hear these words, we're not gonna delve into them, but the headers in the Merkle trees use something called SHA-256, which is a standard, which is literally 256 bits long. That's like zeros and ones for 256 registries. Um, but a Bitcoin address actually, Satoshi Nakamoto threw in a loop. I'm glad to debate why, but he uses two hash functions for Bitcoin addresses. And the one thing I saw that he actually wrote about it is he said, if one of them is broken, at least the other one is less likely to be broken. So it was, as I've read about it, I think in his own voice is, you have to hash something twice, and he was just making it that much more secure, even though, Aline, it was one out of 10 to the 40th chance. Yeah, which is astronomically low. So, um, so remember, where's Caroline? I don't remember. She, there we are. You asked me about, uh, I thought I'd set it up for today, but you were good to remind me for Tuesday. What's the longest running hash, uh, uh, a time-stamped hash? That is a great question. <laughs> <laughs> the Thank you for the compliment. <laughs> um, the answer is, yeah, I don't, I <laughs> I put it down phonetically, so I'm not sure if I'm totally butchering this one. But it came out of Dell Labs with Stuart yeah. Haber and yeah. Schwarty. There he is. Yeah. yeah. So Haber and his, his colleague. Yes? You got it. That's my roommate. That's your roommate. Terrific. <laughs> so um, I'm just trying to say it wasn't Bitcoin that had it. He, he, he did this in 1991. But by 1995, they started a company called Shorty. I don't think it took off that much. It's not competing with Apple for the largest market cap or anything like that, um, or Facebook. Uh, but every week, in the notices section, you can see a hash, literally, <laughs> that there's a, it's time stamped because it's in the New York Times, and, and it's a hash, all those funky digits and everything of all the information came before it, and they're basically hashing any document. Any document that you want to timestamp in that week, you put it in, one follows another, and that's a blockchain. It's not about money, there's no native currency, um, and so forth. I believe that Haber and uh, Sternetta are three of the eight or nine footnotes in the Satoshi paper. Maybe it's four of them. So he gets his credit. 
And if you go to his website, Stuart Haber, I think he says uh, blockchain's co-founder on his personal website. Who knew? Um, so here we get, this was in the National Institute, uh, the NIST paper. But timestamp depend only logs in Bitcoin or blockchain. What is put together is the header, the top information. And if I can go past the visual and just say what's there. There's five pieces of key information. The version, it doesn't change that often, but there is a version number. The previous block's hash. So it's some information about all the blocks that came before it. The Merkle root hash, which, does anybody want to tell me what that does? The Merkle root? So it essentially puts the transactions in the uh, bottommost layer of the tree and then creates a tree of hash of each of the transactions. Right. So if I, if I go back to the, the, this nice little picture, the yellow box at the bottom of each of these blocks is all the transactions. There could be upwards to 1,000, 2,000 transactions in a block. So this blockchain concept, 1,000, 2,000. There's means and methods well before uh, Nakamoto's paper about how to compress that, how to keep that information a little bit tidier. And that uses this thing called Merkle roots. The thing, the, the five items right at the top, the, what's called the block header, doesn't have the thousand transactions. And earlier, Kelly, you had asked me about full nodes and light nodes. A light node or a wallet that anyone here could uh, uh, download on your cell phone probably does not download the millions of transactions that have happened in the history of Bitcoin. You are unlikely to download what's called a full node, but you might download all the headers, this bit of information that's all of the headers. All of the information in Bitcoin is still not that large. It's less than 200 gigs. Um, but the, 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 all of the headers, I think, is single digit gigs. I can't remember if it's four or six gigabytes right now. What is the number? The header is 80 bytes, so it's 80 bytes times 500,000, which is 50 megabytes, 60 megabytes of headers. So it's 60 megabytes, so it's, it's much smaller, as, as opposed to like 180 gig. So Satoshi was thinking in advance, and every blockchain that you're going to work on likely, I mean, there might be some, that this concept of it's really keeping the security by a little bit of information in something called a header, and then pushing all the meat of the transaction and data down. And this is really important when you get to like Ethereum, where there's a lot of data and a lot of computation down in each of these blocks. It's sort of like if Stuart Haber um, uh, uh, had a lot of documents and pictures and everything. He didn't, he, you don't have to have all the picture quality in a whole movie. You can actually hash a whole movie and you still get these 256 bits. Um, so, um, oops. So the, the header has the previous hash, this Merkle root, which is just a way to get all the transactions. Just think of a Merkle root as a way to grab 2,000 transactions, in a way. A timestamp, that one's easy, we can get that. Difficulty target. Does anybody know what, what uh, blockchain Bitcoin tried to do to make it more or less difficult over time? Oh, Brodish, we've heard. Hugo. Uh, more difficult over time, but such that it stays with creating a block every 10 right. minutes. So with more computational power, it gets harder to mine a block. So, so it's harder to find a block the more miners there are. So every block header needs to have some, what's called a difficulty target. How difficult is the mining going to be? Since we're talking about mining next Tuesday, please all bring me back to difficulty target. And then, what's a nonce? What's that? Of just random number. 
a random number that's used once, number of once, nonce. Um, and that's, that's hash functions. How do we do? They're a little off the skids. We are MIT. Yes? I have a question. If the number of characters in the hash is limited, your The output, number? not the input. Oh, the, no, not the input, but the number of characters in the hash is limited, right? So that's right. like a pool of options that you have. But you have many, many transactions, that's like a flow, right? So eventually you're just consuming and consuming hashes up to a point where you're going to repeat the hash, right? So how do you know for the same hash if you have two different information to, to which information you're referring to? So uh, could you help me pronounce your first name just to? Guillermo. Guillermo. Um, has asked the right question. He's saying, well, how do you know, especially as you have more and more time and more and more time, you might get the same output of a hash from different inputs. And if you recall, uh, wait, somebody does recall. No, before Brodish, in front of Brodish. Yeah, in the papers, I mentioned that if, like, it's possible that through, through like, uh, like the hash of x is equal to hash of y, but it's if like uh, the miners are working uh, like not at the same time, and if like the same information is not treated at the same exact time, it won't be a problem because then like we we'll just continue uh, with just like two different. Uh, so you're correct as it relates to mining, but there's another piece of it as well: is that the hash function, if it's a good cryptographic secure hash function, is what's called collision resistant where what you're saying is so infeasible, in fact, one divided by 10 to the 40th, you know, that's a one with 40 zeros after it. It's so infeasible to happen. Uh, it's, it's possible, but infeasible to happen. Uh, what you're referencing is, is what if two parties solve the cryptographic puzzle as opposed to a collision, and because of the difficulty yeah, they just got it at the same time. Please. It seemed like a dumb question, but... No, no there's no dumb questions when it comes to this. I don't really mean that. <laughs> Timestamps attributed, so is it from the whole system, or...? So timestamps are not a particularly uh, important part of Bitcoin. They are timestamped, but sometimes if somebody puts something off and it's off by a few minutes or even up to two hours, um, there's a, there's, a, there's a check in the technology and the scripting function if the timestamp's off more than a couple hours. So literally, it's not a, that precise. Uh, having said that, the real way that timestamping happens is if, if a block is mined and it's the 540,000th block and it's sort of accepted and all the nodes, these 10,000 nodes, start mining the 540,000th and first block, the, in essence, it's just, think of it as almost like a stack. And so what's, in essence, more relevant than the actual time that's in the header, and they all have a time stamp in the header, um, but what's more relevant is the order of the blocks and, most importantly, the previous block hash. Yes? and say that without the timestamps, you cannot do this difficulty readjustment. So timestamps are very important. If you don't have timestamps in the block, you cannot do the difficulty readjustment, which is necessary to keep the rate of blocks 10 minutes. Half I, 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 I'm going to partially agree with you because the difficulty adjustment happens every two weeks. So even if any one individual or five or six timestamps are a little goofed up in the two weeks, uh, the algorithm is basically looking over the course of about 2,000 blocks. So, yeah. so a little goof up is fine. It's fine, but you need the timestamps. Yeah. You need the timestamps, but it's, an, it, it's more important is basically the, uh, here, I'll go back a slide. It's the order of the blocks. Please. Um, going back to collisions, um, the paper didn't really go into detail, but it said like in addition to how unlikely it is with like to the, the power 128 that even if there were two that hashed to the same um, kind of hash digest, that it would be 
unlikely that they would be valid in the context. So given like what's a valid blockchain transaction that that kind of even further reduce the likelihood of any problems, which there wasn't a lot of detail into why like the blockchain context would even make two big hash to the same value even more unlikely. Um, I want to hold that question for Tuesday, but it has to do with, rather than the collision issue, what the paper is talking about is if two miners solve the puzzle. And that doesn't mean that they got identical hashes, because the puzzle is not geared to getting an exact hash. The Bitcoin puzzle is having a certain number of leading zeros. So it's literally, it started, I think it was nine or 10 leading zeros. I'm talking about 10 years ago. And now you have to hash to something with, I think it's about 20 or 26 leading zeros. Meaning it's gotten more and more difficult and the result of the hash has to have a bunch of leading zeros, which you saw in that video. I'm sorry. Uh, I have a question on like how the hash, the local root hash comes about. So if it's only, if it's only hashing the transactions, how does it change when the hash of the previous block changes? Okay, so Adian. Adian, it, it reminds me of that old television show, Johnny Carson, and you just did a great setup for the comedian, so thank you. Um, uh, so I'm going to go to Merkle Roots. So Merkle Roots, which are a binary, binary data tree, looks something like this. If one had a thousand transactions, I wouldn't have a pretty slide, so this only goes to four levels. But think of four transactions at the bottom. They're each hashed. And then you concatenate, you put the two hashes together, you hash that, you keep going up the tree. If you had a thousand transactions, because that's two to the tenth, roughly, then you'd have ten levels of this tree. And so that's what happens. And literally, the, the mining pool operators are doing this a lot for the nodes. But uh, in the Bitcoin core uh, application, in the, in the software that you, anybody in this room could download the software if you wish, there's software that helps, takes transactions, puts them basically into this binary tree called a Merkle tree, uses hash functions, and basically skinnies it all the way up to the top. Is that? Uh, I think what my question was, was that if, if this, like, uh, given that this structure exists, how does the root hash change with the previous block? So basically, we saw in the video that if you change the hash of the previous block, all the blocks forward will get invalidated because the hash changes. So, but it doesn't seem to use the previous hash. So, so I'm going to uh, repeat the question. Does a Merkle root that is basically a summary of the 10,000 transactions that are in a block change if the rest of the header changes or the previous block change? And the answer is no. It only changes if some of the data in the 10,000 transactions change. And so a Merkle root will change if you put different transactions in the mix. Or, as is really important, one of the incentives. You get your 12 and a half Bitcoins today in what's called a coin-based transaction. And so one of these thousand transactions is the, the payment to the miner. So the Merkle root would be different depending upon who wins. Um, but that wasn't your question, I'm just saying. But Merkle roots, uh, are a very efficient way to take thousands of transactions, store it up, have one spot. Please. So the order of the different transactions has to be exactly the same for everyone that is hashing, right? No, actually not. So if you're hashing and you're running a mining rig and Elan's running a mining rig, if Elan solves the puzzle, and propagates it out on the network, and people start mining on top of Elon's block, because they say, well, he's finished. You're, you're, not, you're just going to probably start mining on the top of his block and look in something called the mempool. The memory pool is on this network 
of all the free floating transactions, you'll scoop up the next set of transactions. And, and so can, how can we validate that all the transactions that he wrote are the real ones? All right. So validation, which is, which is more next Thursday, but I'll give it a shot. No, no, no. It's a good question. Every transaction, or actually you're setting me up, digital signatures. There you go. Thank you. Did you have a question? Or I'm going to go into this. So the second cryptographic thing, and we're going to keep going back and forth. Hash functions are basically a way to compress a lot of data, have a fingerprint, make sure that it's basically a commitment. Um, digital signatures. Well, remember that little graph that we had, Alice and Bob. Alice wants to send a note to Bob and just say, hello, Bob. She wants to encrypt it. She encrypts it with Bob's public key, sends it to him, he decrypts it with his private key. You might say, oh my God, Gensler, what's a private key? What's a public key? In cryptography, it's a way to kind of scramble information. I know, I'm really making this like, but it, it so if we went back to that little mechanism the Romans used, or we used what the Germans used in the Enigma machine, they were symmetric cryptography. Both people had the key. The key was the Enigma machine with five rotors. In the 1970s, some wonderful technologists here and elsewhere basically said, well, what if the key isn't the same? Because the adversary can steal the key. What if it's not symmetric, but it's asymmetric? There's a private key and a public key. In essence, there's two keys that have some mathematical relationship. And the math between these two keys don't matter for a class like this, but know that the public key and the private key link together. They're bonded together, but the critical thing is about digital signatures, there's three functions. You have to generate a key pair, and when a key pair is generated, a public key and a private key are generated at the same time. And they need a random number to go into it. And one of the things that makes a lot of Bitcoin and other wallets insecure, and it's probably why some have been hacked, the wallets, not Bitcoin, is because they don't have good random number generation. Yes, Brodish. Um, I saw, I was at a conference last week where uh, uh, a, a, a technologist from University of Pennsylvania had done a survey of 150 hedge funds, mining companies, and Bitcoin wallet companies and the like. So they actually let a cybersecurity individual get inside and do a survey of 150 what you would consider really committed high-end users of Bitcoin, you know, miners and hedge funds and, 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 and uh, crypto exchanges. And it was horrifying, their cybersecurity as to how they're, what they're doing with their private keys. Before you even got to the private keys, many of them didn't really have a secure way to create the random numbers to create their private keys. So it's just a, a piece. When somebody says they have really good private key, public key, uh, in the back of your mind, just know there's got to be some way to do a random number generation. That's the only math that I'm going to ask you to remember. <laughs> about, uh, uh, there's a signature function, and the key thing is a signature creates, you can create a digital signature from a message and a private key. So if Kelly has a private key and wants to send a secret message to somebody across the room, Isabella, you want a message from Kelly? Kelly's gonna take the message you got this, Kelly? You're going to take the message and you're going to sign it with a private key. You send it over to Isabella. How's Isabella know that it was from you? Um, she has to decrypt it with her. She's got to verify it. So there's a function called a verification function. And it comes back just yes, no. I mean, it might say it differently, but it's a, just a yes, no. It's a verification function. Isabella, you want to do this with me? Is going to verify your signature is valid for this message 
because you have the public key. So you're right. Isabella has your public key, but using your public key, she can verify that the signature. It's magical math. Well, it's not magical math, it's real math. But it's not math we need to study in this class. <laughs> yes, Hugo. Um, back to generating a key pair. Yeah. So they're both generated from the random number. One is not necessarily, like the private key is not determined by the public key or, or the other. Uh, the, the pub, you can think of it, uh, in Bitcoin, it uses an elliptic curve uh, cryptography. And you can think of it as that, that the private key is based on the random number. It's based, it, it, to be more technical, it's, it's the, uh, the random number is what gets you to the public key. But I think of it as the private key is almost the random number and then the public key is generated along with Yes. So, so you, you pick a random number, actually, between 0 and 2 to the 256. That's your private key. To pick a public key, you derive it directly from the private, private key. Okay. In fact, all you do is you exponentiate another number by your private key. Uh, so it's, you can think of the public key as a one-way function of the private key. So given a public key, you cannot recover the private key. If you could, then you could sign, which would be disastrous. And instead of exponentiation in Bitcoin, it uses an, a function called the elliptic curve. But So what properties? And these are the key economic properties as well as cryptographic properties. Basically, it's infeasible. And again, I use the word infeasible. I didn't say impossible, <laughs> even though Aline might want to tell me that it's 1 over 10 to the 40th or something. But it's infeasible to find a private key from a public key. So reverse engineer. So even if you can't find the private key, like in the case of Kelly and Isabella, if I knew Kelly's public key, could I send a message to Isabella impersonating Kelly? No. You need to do a signature uh, if you please just run your eye up there. To do a digital signature, you need a private key and a message, and it's a function of the message and the private key. By, by uh, a sort of, let's call it complex math. That digital signature was created from the private key, and the public key was created from the private key. And to oversimplify, the reason that the verify function works is because both the digital signature and the public key that Isabella has. Isabella has this digital signature, and she has the um, public key, and she has the message. The, the math is such that basically the private key, if you wish, almost like factors out. Uh, you know, you, you, but it, it, think of two functions. She's got the, Isabella has Kelly's public key, the message, the digital signature. It either verifies or it doesn't. But she never has to see the private key. And in fact, Kelly does not want her to ever see the private key. Eric, um, maybe just to simplify that, uh, the way the validation of a digital signature works is Kelly's message is run through a hash function, which generates a hash, and is encrypted with her private key. Then the message unencrypted and the digital signature goes to Isabella. Isabella, what she does is uses the same hash function to run it with the document to generate a hash function and uses the public key of Kelly to unencrypt the signature and compare those two hashes. If those two hashes correspond, that means that it, the message belongs to Kelly, and it hasn't been tampered with. So that's the, more or less the simplification of the, the digital signature process. Well, I, I don't know if you... The, the, so, 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 I mean, the, the key is basically that there's a scheme unrelated to Bitcoin that exists for many other reasons on the Internet, and many other reasons in, in commerce and in war, <laughs> that this public key, private key cryptography, and it's not simply, uh, just going back, it's not just simply Alice sending something, it's also digital signatures. You generate the key pair, 
everything in Bitcoin, everything in Ethereum has key pairs, public key and private key, a digital signature, but Kelly, never lose your private key. You got that? Do not. And by the way, you have to create it with a good random number generator because most sophisticated hedge funds around the world aren't. So you're going to be better than those. That's what I learned at a conference I was at recently. And then there's a verification function. Uh, a quick question about the random number generator and the verification function. So is there any like third party generating the generator or the generator is like a function already existing and like already there? You're welcome. So, so the question is, is if random number generation is so important, are there outside parties that have good software in essence to produce the random number generation? And the answer is yes, and there's some that are not so good. And yes, some good laptops have it. Um, at the heart, I, I want to skip ahead. Elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. That's the actual algorithm that Bitcoin uses to take the private key and so forth. But many of the the wallets, if you, if you download a wallet application to hold your Bitcoin, to hold your Litecoin, to hold some other coin, that wallet application has a, uh, a um, random number generation software. I can't attest to all the random number generation software. I'm not a cybersecurity uh, expert. But there's probably a range of some that are a little bit more... Uh, uh, the stronger ones. The key to random number generation is if you're generating any length that it truly is not clumpier, it, 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 there's, it, that I'd say it's what, uh, maximum entropy, you know, and that you really don't have any clumps. If it all clumps in one area, then that's not great randomness. So I just want to finish because there's one other thing we're going to chat about to l lay the groundwork is Bitcoin addresses. I put that up. You can look at the slides later. The details don't matter much. But the key thing is, is that when you hear somebody talk about public keys and Bitcoin addresses, colloquially, we all re reference them the same. They're actually not. The technology that Nakamoto did was he uses the public key. He literally hashed it twice. Once with, with this program, this hash function called SHA-256, another hash function, then concatenates and puts a little check sum at the end, and then uses something called a base 58 to make it even shorter. I've gone back and read some of Nakamoto's emails for the two years after he published all this, and I've read other things. My understanding is, is the reason there's two hash functions and actually two different ones was just to make everything a bit more secure. Also, a public key is a very long, it's about 512 bits. And so you can shrink the data and make the data more compressed by hashing it, which took it to 256 bits. He hashes it twice, and then he does this base 58 that makes it even a little tighter. Um, so for all purposes, you can go ahead and just use public key and Bitcoin address is the same, but remember back in, in, in the mind, oh, actually they're, they're a little different. And Bitcoin addresses are a little bit more secure, supposedly, unless of course somebody's hacked into your wallet and figured out all these little details. Um, a Bitcoin address is a little bit like the signatures on these notes we talked about, right? Remember what, a, half of you don't use checking accounts, but these are early forms of checks, and there's a signature on the bottom. That's really kind of uh, a Bitcoin address. The, I'm sorry, the signature is the digital signature. The address, the Bitcoin address, is who it's paid for, and I promised last slide. We're going to be talking about this next week, transactions, all that stuff that rolls up into the Merkle trees, all that little itty bitty important information, they basically have an input and an output. The input and a lock time. But the input is a previous transaction. This 
uniquely identifies basically money. And you're going to send value in Satoshis. He named the unit of account for himself. There's a lot of Satoshis in every one Bitcoin. That's why we don't hear much about Satoshis, but there's 10 to the eighth Satoshis in every one Bitcoin. Um, so when you actually enter in the computer code and a transaction, you're doing it in Satoshis. Um, and it's sent to a public key. That's a coin. That is what the incentive system's all about. Any other questions? And this is just, a, I know, there's a lot. I wonder how many of you are gonna come back on Thursday. <laughs> no, let me, let me say this. It's not just that we're at MIT, but we are at MIT, come on. <laughs> Everybody in this room can get these kind of key concepts. The, the key questions that we talked about were time stamp depend only logs. Does anybody want to tell me what a time? What, if this class here in the next seven minutes can get these two concepts, that's all we talked about for the last hour. So um, I don't know your name in the orange shirt. What's that, Andrew? Andrew, what's time append only logs? Time stamp depend only logs is essentially a record of transactions or a block as blockchain uses it. Um, with a time, and that can't be changed in the future. So you can only add on transactions. So it's kind of immutable because of all this cryptography. Stuart Haber was making it in a time stamp append only log, and he was placing it where? Carolyn, you still with me? Where was Haber putting it? Uh, New York Times. New York Times, there you go. In the classified section. Um, so it's just, it's a bunch of blocks of data compressed up, so we talked about something called Merkle trees and Merkle roots. Just think about it as, that's a way to take a lot of information and compress it, but also make it searchable later. Because a thousand transactions, when we talk next week, you have to be able to verify. Somebody asked me about how to verify, right, Jofen? When you go back to verify, you need an index number to find it in that Merkle tree situation. And it's secured through hash functions. Anybody want to tell me the easiest lay definition of a hash, hash function? Jennifer. Um, it's like a mapping from, can be, lots of numbers can be up to just one. Right. You could take a picture of this classroom and everybody exactly, and it could map into something. I don't know, would a QR code be a form of a hash? Not cryptographically secure, but is it a is it a hash? It's more of a different representation for some data rather than binary. If you're using all right, so I failed that one. It didn't. Um, it often stores hashes. Yeah. So cryptographic hash function is a way to take not only a lot of information and put it into a fixed form, but the key thing here is the hash functions are what tie the blocks together because hash functions can point to previous information. And as the video showed, if you change any of the underlying information, the hash changes. So what does that give you? It basically secures the data. You know if somebody's tampered. So the only reason to really learn about hash functions is it's to say, oh, I get it. This is one of the ways to make this data tamper-proof. Go on. I have a question about a theor theoretical event where a better hash function, hash function is found than the uh, SHA-256. And um, how would that be implemented into the Bitcoin network practically? Uh, there needs to be a consensus and code. So, so uh, how, how would any relevant change be adopted into Bitcoin is always a challenge because it's a de decentralized network. And all decentralized networks uh, have a little bit of a governance challenge. The governance challenge is how do you do software updates? We all know that on our laptops, our, our iPhones, there's probably software updates going on here now unbeknownst to me, right? They're probably just apples, drop. I mean, who knows what they're doing in here, right? And, and Uber, I really, one of my favorites. Who knows what's happening inside this phone? But the, the commercial um, 
enterprise, the central authority has a way to update the software. We probably signed some terms of use that allows them to do that. In, in a decentralized network like this, there has to be consensus. And so the only way really to update the software for a new hash function or for most everything else is in essence that the nodes, the operators of the software collectively in a consensus form adopt it. So it's another way that not only is the data immutable because of these hash functions, but the software is. And that comes both with benefits and costs. Some people would say that's a bug of blockchain. Some people would say it's a feature. You can come to your own judgment over the course of the semester. But the software is harder to update than software in centralized authorities, because centralized authorities just say, they just push the, the um... now sometimes you have to click and say update. So, that, but, but don't be naive, not every software do you click. I mean, there's some that's just happening. But here, you've got to have consensus. Um, I know it didn't answer your question about the hash function, but if it were a hash function that had to be updated and everybody said they had to quickly update it, um, there's, there's interesting debates about this, but you wouldn't need to go back over all 540,000 previous uh, blocks. You could just hash all 540,000 blocks, 180 gigabytes, to one 256, or maybe it's then a different, and, and then you'd have that, uh, and it would be tamper-proof. So those are the key things. That's what we covered, really. What we're going to cover um, next Tuesday is consensus protocol. We've talked a lot about proof of work here <laughs> because everybody thinks of Bitcoin about proof of work. But we're going to talk about proof of work, the nodes, and the native currency. And then next Thursday, we're going to talk about transactions. Again, I try to break down this technology if you want to forget about this lecture and you're going to go, oh my God, it was like going to the dentist, you can tell your friends that you actually know something about cryptography. It is called cryptocurrencies, so how could we not know something about cryptography? But it's basically those three things. It's cryptography, it's a consensus mechanism, and the transactions. So right? Cryptography, <laughs> consensus mechanism, transactions. And we'll get through it. And then you'll see this matters to finance and whether it's got any use cases. So thank you.